area. This area has uh, changed a lot. Um, to where my mum came to uh, Bada's wife's home. Uh, she had to flee from Middlesbrough from my dad. Because my dad was like a, a very violent and, and nasty person to her. I used to live in Middlesbrough till I felt pregnant with Shane. When his father found out I was pregnant with him, I, I started getting abused. He hit me with car batteries, sweeping brushes, pirates vases, um, locked me in the gas cupboard to try and gas me. Um, he tried to kill the baby when I was pregnant. He was a handful from being able to walk, but by pinching from the shops, he was about six years old, shoplifting from the age of six. And that's when he used to run away with his friends. I met Shane when I was about six, seven year old, and we just started knocking about together since then. Uh, we got in a lot of trouble together, burning houses, pinching cars, motorbikes, everything really. <laughs> Police used to fetch him home for pinching like sweets or cars. The neighbours used to think he was funny. We'd pinch a car, travel out the area, and we'd go and knock on someone's door, just out of the blue. Um, and we'd just be like stood there, two little kids or three of us, and we'd all be stood there and we'd be like, Excuse me, do you know where Peter Lee is? And then we'd get him. So these this man or woman would be like, Oh, Peter Lee's miles away, we'd be like, we're really far from home, can we have a sandwich and a drink of pop or, you know, something like that. And so they'd feel sorry for us and say, oh, come on in. And when we sat down, they'd say, oh, do you want, well, do you want pop or do you know, and then they'd go and basically go and make us something to eat. Soon as they went out the room, we would be on the hunt. So we'd, if we found a handbag or a purse or a wallet, we'd instantly do one straight away, because we know there's going to be some money. So if we got that, we'd just run out of the house before they come. Yeah, I remember uh, one day we uh, blanked our way to a house and uh, while we were in, we searched the house from top to the bottom. And uh, what happened was is um, we couldn't find out. We were proper gutted and on the way out, we were like, oh, we'll go and do somewhere else. But we were hungry. <laughs> we may have went to a biscuit tin and opened the biscuit tin up and it was full of thousands of pounds of rolled up notes. And we were just like proper buzzing, just went and ran out the house with all the money and went. When we used to score, we used to go straight to town and buy ourselves like, £150 night air max trainers, uh, £100, £200 tracksuits, you know, and just and spend it. You know, sometimes we'd have thousands of pounds and we'd waste it. You know, I, I have to be truthful, you know, I didn't have no morals or are them older or them younger. We just burgled whatever we came across when we were young, naive, and just did whatever we, we did. Cheers, it's hard when your kids, you, every parent thinks that kids can't do not wrong, but nobody's kids are perfect. So what we used to do was run away from home because our mums wouldn't let us come and play or knock about together. So we'd run away and just meet up with each all of us and we'd just go out. The police would be hunting us down. And while they're hunting us, like, trying to find us, we'd be out for about four or five days. Imagine the worry of your parents, four or five days out, grafting constantly, constantly burgling, constantly pinching cars. When we were first pinching cars, it was metros, because you know, we only had the strength to snap the steam locks on them, because we were just kids hanging off the steam wheels trying to snap them. It took a few chases, we got away from a few chases as well. The helicopter tends to focus on the driver, so when a driver runs off, they hunt him down, you know. So we get away sometimes, but uh, just that's what we did, you know. And we just we pinch cars, go out rallying about, and then we just go to our mates to show off. And then we'd all, everyone would pile in and then we'd go up on the field and spin about the field and handbrake about and then set the car on fire and like do one and go, go to the next victim really. I used to ground shit um, when he did something wrong and then he used to throw the mattress out the bedroom window then he used to jump out on top of it. So I ended up nailing his bedroom window down and putting locks on his bedroom door for his own safety, nothing else, so he couldn't harm himself. And then he used to run away and I used to get the police to go looking for him and he used to find him all over the place. And then when, I, when the brought him home, I, I couldn't punish him because I was more relieved to say he was okay. Somebody come up to my door complaining about him, I used to say, well, 
I haven't seen them do so I can't check them for it. What, one day somebody came to my house and said, Maz, is it, um, the man got shamed in the house blaming him to try to pinch the car. So obviously, obviously I ran round thinking this bloke was doing it and when, he, when his wife opened the door he had shade on the floor with his knees and his chest and shame was going blue in the face so obviously I just ran him like a long tip and dragged him off and started battering him. I found out afterwards Shane did try to finish the car so I did something I shouldn't have done because I believed Shane and his friends and it was true. I had more fights than enough over him. I still would. I'd still fight over him now if I had to. He's my son, he's my, he's my life, isn't he? Everyone I knew burgle houses and pinch cars and stole, robbed shops. So to me, that's what you did. We weren't a, a normal kind of shoplifter either. We, were, we wouldn't just go in and pinch a little uh, bar of chocolate and stuff. We used to walk in and like um, pick up a hi-fi and walk. Because uh, we sussed on that it takes time for the security guard to get us and he has to wait at the door and wait for you leaving. So if we picked it up and went straight to the fire exit, they don't have time to get you. I don't believe in hitting kids. Um, even like she used to get a smack, a smacked hand and things like that and used to say didn't hurt anyway. No matter what I'd done with him, it didn't work. And so we got in with the older lads and we started burgling houses and pinching cars, but it was more you get in the window for us and open the big window because we can't get in. We were buzzing and everyone knew us because we were a little criminals, you know, and we would just love being with them. Because back then, you know, it wasn't your DVDs now, it was like your cassette players. And like, you could get like 150 quid for a, like a really good like video player. You know what I mean? So we'd get a video player and sell it straight for 100 quid. And these were what people would call law abiding. They worked, they'd never been to prison, they'd never been locked up. But as soon as you went to their door with a a dodgy bit of gear, they'd soon buy them off here in my area. So everything I was around just seemed to be dodgy. Every week we'd be at court. Every week my mum would have to drag us to court and get a fine off. Because it was always, uh, we got the trouble because I couldn't, they couldn't do anything for me. Grew up in many houses in Pete Lee. Uh, this was one of them. And then grew up with uh, Gordon, my stepdad. Me and Gordon were together for a couple of years and then we decided to get married because I knew I was going to prison and I needed somebody to look after Shane rather than going to care. So me and Gordon decided to get married and I went to jail for three and a half months, I think it was. And uh, tried everything he could to keep us out of bother but it didn't work. But my mum ended up going to prison and when she went to prison, uh, my dad looked, like, looked after me when I was younger. A visa, a visa card come through my door in somebody else's name and I used it and somebody grassed me up and that's how I got caught. So I ended up going to jail for that one. And I used to just kept getting put in foster cares and foster homes and stuff like that and then get chucked out of them. She went into foster cares because of his behaviour. I, 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 I couldn't control him. He was out of control. And we had to go through and see him because, and then he was trying to kick the car windows and everything out, just get out of the car. So I was in, out, in and out of these places all my life. And uh, the, the, the trouble is, is, at that time, he couldn't really do much with me. Uh, so all I could do was uh, send me to foster parents and, and homes and, and stuff like that. And I was just, um, I'd just run away and go out on the graft, as we call it, stealing again, and there's just nothing we could do. So it was just like a cycle, uh, caught, send her a foster parents or a home, run away, commit more crimes, back to court, you know, it was just a cycle of things like that. And eventually I ended up going to a boarding school where you go there through the week and come home at weekends, call it Eleanor Hall in there, uh, Easton Lane. And it's meant to be designed for naughty people. So naughty kids go there who can't be controlled in normal school, so they'll come, come to this boarding school. Every single one of these young people who come to this, the residential school were damaged in one way or other. Um, and they came with a lot of baggage. You dealt with every single child as an individual, a unique individual. There was always some way in that you could get, and you knew if you did that, that would make, a, make them punish him a little bit, and they would toe the line, and they would do whatever. But with Shane, nothing worked. I mean, what was really certain with Shane is it's... Uh, even back in the age of 12, I can remember him saying he, he wanted to kill 
and that's the word he would use. He'd actually dream and fantasize about ways he would actually want to kill a police officer. Just to get into that next rung of respect amongst the, 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 the people he was hanging around with. That's how much he wanted to be feared. How much, to be quite honest with you, how, how evil the lad was. He had hatred and a bitterness to, to, to his core, even at the age of 12. We got this lad who we thought was a bit of a bully and we got him onto this big massive field and we just battered him, like proper battered him. But once we started kicking into him and beating him up, we sort of didn't stop for ages. He was screaming and we were just punching him, kicking him, beating him up, booting him in his face. And then we sort of got a... Uh, tried to rip his clothes off and then chucked into his big massive pond. We actually got this young man. It actually took us a couple of minutes to actually decipher who it was. He was covered in mud, where the road got a hill, uh, covered in blood. It's just like to say, evil to the core. So Andy Smith chased has caught me in the woods. And I remember getting a hold of him and saying, and the exact words he actually said to him at the age of 12 was, unless God does something miraculous in your life, there's no helping you. There's no helping you, because you're just evil to the core. And that was the last I saw of him. The last I saw the school, because I got a charge for that, and I ended up going to court. We all went to court for him being beat up. So that was unfortunately his life, where he started getting locked up, as it were. Uh, while I was in Elamore Hall, after that I went to a Cliff Secure Unit. I got three years, uh, Section 53, and got three years as a young kid. And the Secure Unit was great, you know, it was just like a little front room. It was just, they just sort of locked, there was a little wall around, that's it. It was really good, really. And then I ended up going to Young Offenders. So I ended up going to uh, Dewalt. Um, North Allerton, uh, Weatherby, you know, places there, prisons like that, uh, Moulins. Uh, and so I did my little rounds when I was uh, in, in Young Offenders. Pretty violent places when you're in Young Offenders because it's always it's that mentality of that pride with young lads, like I'm the top dog, I'm the artist. And so there's a lot more fights and like violence goes on in Young Offenders with people trying to establish themselves. I used to get picked on a lot. Uh, and bullied a lot, you know, and obviously I had ginger hair and sometimes it's not nice, you know, you get picked on. And like, I just, I never felt fitted in. That's probably why I fitted in with every, all the criminals and stuff, because I fitted in, I guess. But as I was getting older, I was getting fed up with being picked on and used and people taking liberties out of me. And I just remember uh, for the first time, I think I was about 16, 16, 17, I finally fought back with somebody. I remember people were like, oh yeah, and they were coming up to me and shaking my hand and talking to me, and I, f I just remember thinking, I like this. This is what I want. I want this attention, I want to be, I want people to know who I am. I ended up going drinking all the time to the pub, just to get away from shit, because it was peace. Do you know what I mean? And then um, we used to end up going back home, and we used to just go to bed out the way of him, and just let him do what he wanted in the house. And my mindset started to change and I would, um, I just remember I was, uh, still wasn't known as being nuts or out like but just beginning to fight back. Beginning to be this lad where people knew that like, you know, you're going to say something, you're going to fight it, you know. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, not claimed to be the hardest man around because I wasn't. We started to get scared of myself, my husband now. Members of my family were getting scared of shit. Um, I was petrified of him. But I just started to become an extra game to the point of where um, this is how my mind started going. Like, if, if we were walking down the street and someone pointed somebody out, said, See him over there, he's hard, him, or he's crazy, don't mess with him, it almost became a challenge to me in my head. I remember seeing him docking about you know, after that all the time and he, he, he was like a, like a raging lunatic just walking down the street and what he'd do is he'd stop. It'd be 10, 15 of us stood in the corner and he'd stop and he'd just start glaring at us, staring at us as if he, you know, as if he wanted someone to, one of my pals, he was here looking at and I'd be like, whoa, whoa, listen, something wrong with him, give him a wide berth, there's something wrong with him. For me, he was a lad on the area, he was a pretty handy lad at the time. And I drove up on a motorbike. And when I drove up, he was stood with a can of beer 
and he was drinking the can of beer and he dropped the can of beer by accident. So I just looked like that and I looked up at him. And when I looked up at him, the panic in his face and he practically jumped down on the floor and he was like, oh, sorry, mate, I'm sorry about that. And I just got this feeling of like, yes, look at that. He's meant to be gaming. And I thought he, that was it. That did something to my mind. And I just, from then on, I just started going absolutely nuts. I would watch the wrong kind of films to watch, you know, and I'd repeat them where people were getting killed. You know, I'd watch films where people were getting stabbed to death and gangster films where gangsters are doing drive-by shootings. And I would get this rush. My mindset started there because I didn't, you know, I wanted to be a bit tough, but I didn't think that I was going to become, suffer with mental health. And that's what started to happen. And I started to watch these films and they started to affect me because of my mindset would be, uh, I remember Goodfellas, is it Goodfellas? Where the man's stabbing the man and in the back of the boot and it's, and it sounded dead realistic, where I fought at the time. And uh, I just remember getting my hairs used to stand on end and I used to think, yes, I'm gonna be a gangster. Threatening to kill people, threatening to shoot people, threatening to stab people. And I thought, what's wrong with me? Is he meant coming out with something like that? Do you know what I mean? You, do, you can't believe your kids seeing things like that. It was awful and I just, I didn't know what to do at the time. I lost a feeling of fear and love. Uh, you know, like someone who's going to go and have a fight, someone who's going to go and do something will instantly think, I'll have a fear, oh, I'll get lifed off. Or, oh, he's too hard, he'll come and shoot me. That disappeared out of my life. Something happened and I can't put a finger on when it happened or where. All I remember is that I had no love for anyone. If anyone who I looked in my family had died, I wouldn't have shed a tear. And at the end, me and my husband decided to get another house and let Shane have my house. So, to try and give me his own independent and everything. So that's what we've done, just to get away from him, so he could have his own house. If someone said to me, see him over there, he will shoot you dead. we like, will he? We'll see about that. And then I would go to them. The biggest and hardest man that I used to think, I'll win. No matter who you are, but I'll win. And you better kill me, because if you don't kill me, I'm going to come back and I will kill you. I don't know, it just went off the rails. It was awful to know what your kid, you don't know what's going on in the head. Do you know what I mean? You don't know if they really want to kill somebody or they're just using it, but Shane was, there was something wrong with him. And I remember going into this club, I was selling ecstasy tablets at the time, eh? they call them on the streets. Uh, drug, you know, get a good buzz on weekends and stuff. This local handy lad, he's there with his boys with his long leather jacket thing on, thinks he's something. And he come up to me, went, where were you? So I went and sat down, I looked to the side and I thought, if I don't do anything here, all them there are going to go around the estate and tell everyone that I got pulled up by this lad and I didn't do anything about it. And so I made a choice there and then that I had to make an example of him. But as I, as I made that choice in my head, he said the worst thing to me. And he said, uh, you want to mess about with the big boys, do you? And I just snapped. And I put my face into his face and I said, no, no, no. I said, you're messing about with the big boys. And I said, get outside because I'm going to kill you. Got a nine-inch kitchen blade ready. And when I heard the door open, I just turned around and stabbed him straight through the top of his, like, top of his chest, shoulder, back part of here straight through his body. Uh, I pulled it out and made like, like a vacuum sound and it just dropped to the floor. Blood, it was just like what you say out of a movie, like really like where you, you don't think it comes out so fast. It was just like a tap, just coming out down the steps, just running down. His two mates jumped off. They pulled out like little knives and it was like a standoff. So every time I was like trying to stab him, he was trying to stab me and then I was turning, so I was in the middle for a bit. And then one of them was sort of sat forward with his head forward, so he was coming in like lunging like that. He had his head forward, and I thought, right, if I get him here. So I, I, wait, I went to pretend to go and get the other one, and as he come forward, I swung my, my, my knife round him, just missed him, he just got back. If it would have hit him, it would have went straight through his temple. The, the strength, I did it. And he stepped back and he went, Phew. he said he means business him, and they both walked off. I remember going to Hartlepool and uh, we had this um, 
video really. And my mate was trying to sell it and they, these, big, these blokes come out and they try to get involved and try to take it and stuff. Uh, pull, uh, and then what happened is, we have, it eventually it turned out that in the middle of Hartlepool Town Centre, we brought it to a standstill, right in the middle of the road, buses and everything, um, caught up with them. Um, I just remember my mate ran up to him with a bat and he was fighting with a bat, but he was only a young lad, he was only like 14. But he really respected me at the time, he looked up at me. And so he just ran up with a bat, so I've got your bat, go on. So he ran up with a bat and the lad pulled out armour. And as he was whacking with a bat, I just ran up, pulled out an um, Nine's kitchen blade. This lad ran at me and as he's come to me, he's pulled out a big mash hammer and he smacked it across my head. But as he smacked it across my head, I stabbed him uh, four inches in his head, stabbed him there and it come out of the house and all like that. Uh, and and I just, that was it, I was gone. So there's another. So it was attempted murder at first. The, the first like arrest was attempted murder and obviously they all got knocked down. So, you know, while I'm on bail for the first one, I'm, I've got another. So I've got these two attempted murders um, over me. Stabbed the lad in the head in that repeal and I got raided by um, force, what they call them, they come with the guns and all that. Then my house got raided and all that. When I went out for Shane, I said, don't come home, the police are looking for you. I've been raided, so Shane went on the run. Big mistake, I should have told him, I should have let him come home and let the police get him. And so I just come to a point where I thought, I just felt like, um, you know what, sack it. Just get people. You know, before you get it, you're going to get a big stretch, so just go wild. In my head, I give up on life. No one could have come in front of me without getting killed or stopped, stabbed up or anything back then. So I couldn't go and sign on at the door if I was on the door, because I knew the police would know the way for me there, and they probably did. And I couldn't um, I couldn't get a job, because obviously the police know. So they, I did what I, I knew, it, and, and I went and taxed a few people. Uh, one of them was a, a good friend who I regret really, do you know what I mean? I, but I went in the house, I saw a lad some uh, uh, money on the side, a big rolled up and there was like him, he was having a bucket. There was about five, six, seven, maybe more lads all sat on the bed, you know, just chilling out. And I went in and I had my knife down on my side and I just said, a uh, lot of money on the side there. And he was like, yeah, man. I said, give us a look. And because he was a pal, he was like, oh yeah, there was loads there. And he was big, like showing up a bit. And I just went, cheers. Put, put them in my pocket, said you're taxed. And what taxing means is like, if you have a local drug dealer or a local criminal, and you go and take his drugs off him or you go and take his money off him, you know what I mean? And so you call it taxing. And uh, so I just basically said, um, you're taxed really, you know what I mean? And he was like, shut up man, give us a day out, what are you doing? Pushing him back a bit and I pulled the knife out. And, and it was funny this, because I felt like it was a school teacher to myself. No, this is my mental health probably. He's, I remember looking at all the lads and they were all just sat on the bed. You know, there was loads of them, they could have all like, you know, they were all just sat on the bed like that. And I, I, I had my knife and I pointed at them all and I was going, any use, tell the police on me. I'll tell anyone about this, I'm gonna kill you. Do you understand? They're all like, it's not to do with me, Shane, it's not to do with me. You know, so that, that's the bit of fear I had in people at the time. Because I was on the run, I wasn't gonna be sleeping in people's houses where I knew the police were raiding. So we said, we'll sleep in the car. So we all slept in the car, fell asleep. And how the bobbies, the police caught us is that um, they went past in the car and saw that because all of us were in the car asleep, it steamed the windows up. And so they've come and said there's someone in there, so they've started searching the car. And when they started uh, like looking at the lights and that in, and I remember there was a car in front of us and a car behind, and I jumped into the front seat and I was just contemplating myself. So I just ram keep ramming and ramming and ramming not till I get out. and. And I just thought, you know, I'd sack it and I'd just give myself up, open the door and we all got arrested. Yeah, so anyway, I, I went to court and I had all these stuff on me, but what was good is some of them got dropped, you know, like not dropped as in dropped. Some of them did get dropped, but some of them got like uh, knocked down to lesser charges, which uh, eventually led to me getting a uh, four year, nine month in prison. Yeah, I went to prison, it was in North Allen. And Shane had a cell by himself. No other inmate would be padded up with them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let no one else in the cell. The governor actually couldn't be cell one night. The jail was overcrowded. He actually asked me to go in with Shane because Shane was, I was the only person he'd allow in, with, in his cell with him. And 
actually give Shane one of my meals one night and he start going mad in the cell and accusing us of poisoning and trying to poison him, saying I've been putting broken glass in his meals and things like that. We had to sit up all night and talk, explain that we friends before the situation calmed down and realised he wasn't. I become a real big nuisance in North Holland prison. And so they couldn't wait. On my 21st birthday, I went to court and went straight to Home House Prison, Matt Conn's prison. Didn't like the place from, oh, from scratch, really. So I wanted to ship out. So I got this lad in my cell and I had a knife, uh, like a, an homemade blade, but with like three separate razor blades on. And the reason why they do that in prison is so like if there's a slash here, you can't, you can't get clued, so you have to get stitched. And that way it leaves a bigger mark so they can remember, yes, a, a weird mentality. So I used to, I put three or four, like four of them in and I just sort of like had him and I had, the, uh, had him kidnapped in my cell. I had him on the bed, had his hands tied behind his back. You just broke up the hostage situation that's happened with Shane. What you do in a situation like that is you try to get a rapport going with the person. So I remember as if it was yesterday when I actually went to that cell to one of the observation panel. So I used the situation of knowing him very, very well from the past to basically like say, um, Shane, do you remember me from Elmo Hall school days? I just heard this voice coming in the way and he said, uh, Hey, it's Shane. It's Andy Smith. So he's this teacher who I mentioned, who I was at school with, the one who kicked me legs. He's only a prison officer. I haven't seen him since then. He's a prison officer. He says, Mr. Smith, how are you? And it, was, it, was a, it was a real surreal conversation. So I've got this lad at the door with a blade to his neck. And he's like, oh, I've been doing fine. I'm a prison officer. And I was like, oh, great. And we have a conversation. And after five minutes of talking, and I says, she ain't gonna let this young lad go. And he says, yeah, as long as you come in the cell, Mr. Smith, and all, um, and seeing our teams, or things like that, I says, I promise you it'll just be me. And because I knew him, because we had that chat, I just put the knife down, and you come in, when I wouldn't promise you, you wouldn't get, like, muffed up, meaning restrained. And this, we walked down the segregation unit, uh, and he banged me away behind, behind the door. <laughs> before I started going crazy uh, in prison and like, he'd see me every now and then and I was suffering with a bit of mental health. He thought all the prison officers were trying to tamper with his food to the point where I used to have a plastic fork on my back of my trousers. So Andy would come and pull his fork out of his pocket and go, there you go Shane, I've just had a bit, there you go. <laughs> I did have that report which worked well, the escalated situations, but it was, uh, you never, it's, it's a sorry individual, you'd never turn your back on this club that way. While I was in the seg, I would uh, daydream like crazy stuff. He says, you see the little white spiders on the floor, Mr. Smith? He says, there is no white spiders on the floor, Shane. But he was, at the time, looking back at it now, he was mentally unstable. He was, he was, he was a loose cannon, kind of, just put it mildly. In home house, uh, prison in a segregation unit, this is what it's like, really. It's, um, it's a 23 hour bang up. You'll get a shower every two, three days. They've got chairs made out of thick cardboard and it's been designed in a way where it can't like just crumble straight and, and, and your tables cardboard and above your sink you've got a metal sink and a metal toilet and you, you've got like a, a mirror about that big above your, your, your thing and that's it that's all you have you're not allowed radios you're not allowed any of your clothes it's just 24 hours you might they might come around with a book uh, with a library thing and the man comes through and gives you a book you know and you can change your book once a week or two books once a week. You get exercise for one hour, so you can go around the caged yard, like tiny cage yard, for a, for an hour, and that's it. Or if you get um, restrained, you go in the box. No windows, no nout. We tend to put it on freezing cold as well, so they'll take you and strip you off. There's no bed, no mattress, concrete floor. You get this little cardboard tub to wee and poo in, and then that's it. I was outside the prison for the greatest bodily harm. When I was in the segregation unit, you don't actually get to see the other prisoners. Basically, you, you talk through the, these pipes and all that, like echoes. And um, I was talking to this lad, and um, he says, Oh, where are you from? I says, I'm from Peter Lee. 
and uh, he says, what's your name? I said, my name's uh, Robert Foley, he, and uh, I said, what's your name? He says, oh, Chantelle. Can you imagine what it's like being in um, segregated off, solitary confinement or whatever people want to say? Six months, nothing to do, 23 hours bang, one hour walking around the cage, um, nothing to do whatsoever. Can you imagine what that does to somebody who's already mentally ill? I started to think of like killing prison officers and killing people when I got out and I would just daydream all day long. But my daydreams just got twisted and I'm going to kill him, I'm going to do that, I'm going to, you know, and I just got more angry, more hateful towards the system, uh, more aggressive, uh, and it just um, didn't help. After six months, they decided to put me back on the wing, and that's when I did some nasty stuff, nastier stuff. I was a bigger lad then. Uh, I used to train every day constantly, and uh, I just remember the prison officers shouted gym at the end of the landing. And when you shouted the gym, you meant to press your cell buzzer, and he would come round and open people's doors up, but he would never come to my door. I thought, nah, I'm not having this, he's deliberately taking them, he's deliberately doing this. And so I, he got on the, uh, I pressed my buzzer and he come. So why didn't you let me go out of the gym? He went, ah, um, start winding me up. I said, I'm going to do you, you're dead. He went, ah, oh, whatever. I've heard it all before. Mm. It was winding me up and going me. So I built my door and I said, I'm going to get you. I was having a few problems with these lads from Middlesbrough. And um, I was quite small back then, you know what I mean? Like I had a few mental health problems, you know? So people didn't know how to, uh, maybe how to take me, you know? So they were kind of like looking at us a lot and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And I was like getting quite paranoid over it and like wondering what was going on. And Shane noticed it. I don't think there was two places about it. And one day I was going to get my meals and one, there's one of the lads who was, it was like looking at us all the time. And I, to be honest, I thought he was talking about us and things like that, you know, which was getting me like quite stressed, you know, I was getting stressed about it. And anyway, he just looked, he just looked at the lad on the, the lad on the survey and then like the lad looked at him and he just like, the lad kind of like walked two, like two steps backwards. And when, when Shane looked at him and after that, like, because the, the shim was standing right next to me at the survey, and after that, the lads just like, didn't look at us again. So I thought, oh, right, that, that's, that's, you know, less stress for me, it's pretty cool. And uh, so I quite, quite like Shane after that, to be honest with you. I went out on association, that's where all the inmates gathered together, played pool, watch telly, go in the shower, have a shower, you know, go to the gym, all that stuff. And I went up to a lad, well, actually, I went up to a lad and I said, at the end of the week, You've got, it's like, imagine like a cross and in the middle of the cross you've got like a square box and the wings are off the sides but there's gates in between them. It's that square box and that's where the office is and that's how you get in and, on, in and off the wing. And so what officers do, they tend to sit on association near them gates. If anything big kicks off, they can get straight off the wing and lock off, lock the wing off. And so I said to the um, two lads, I said, look, go over to the prison officer, the one I wanted. I said, and just talk to him. And as soon as it kicks off, stand in front of the gate so you can't get off the wing. And then I went up to a lad uh, uh, and, and asked them to throw some pool balls at the prison officers. The day it happened, I was suffering from um, bipolar disorder, but it wasn't a properly it wasn't a properly medicated at the time. When I get manic, I get quite excitable and animated and thinking about these things. All, you know, all the time I thought, well, my instead of thinking about it, I'd want to do it. You did you start chucking the pool balls at the, uh, the officer. And obviously he got up to go off the wing but couldn't because the lad stood in front of him. And as the, as the prison officers come to try and restrain me. I, I'd come out myself with a, a big, the really big coffee jars and I had it like wrapped in a towel to pretend I was going in the showers, you know what I mean? On the pool table, on the, the pockets were made of metal. Uh, they got like a metal shield on the pockets. And remember he got the coffee jar and he smashed the coffee jar and he just went for them slashed at him and like it was a little bit of a standoff and he was trying to swing at me with a bat on and holding the bat on off and I was waiting and I was backing off a little bit and I remember thinking to myself well this doesn't look good you know what I mean all the inmates are watching us he's backing me up and I thought sack it he just stabbed them like in the neck area shoulder neck area and I just remember jumping into him and he went back into the doorway 
And I was like stabbing him and slashing at him and trying to cut him. Then another prison officer came towards you, so he stabbed him as well. Uh, I remember at one stage he had his hands up and he had his feet, like one of his legs up, like in a protection position. And I was trying to slash his legs, trying to stab him, cutting him. Uh, I don't know where I cut them. I even cut my own fingers, you know, where I was cutting them and stuff. I had gashes all over myself. And uh, I ended up, um, after a while, I was doing it, doing it, doing it, and another one come. And then he got injured. The whole place just went up. It was like, became really loud, you know, it was like, it was just like something, to be honest, it was something like off of action, maybe. By now, I'm in a, I'm in a blacked out frenzy. So all I know is two prison officers got um, stabbed uh, by me, and I got charged for the two stabbings. And I was just carried away in the segregation unit. When I heard that my colleague had been stabbed, uh, yeah, I felt physically sick. I felt like um, hurt myself because, like you say, it's my colleague. I didn't want to see that my colleague being hurt and, and my colleague being hurt. Um, but surprised? No, I wasn't surprised because he was an evil individual at the time. I ended up with big injuries myself. I ended up with a big gash across uh, across my arm. And in fact, when I went to court, that was the reason why I didn't get a bigger stretch. And the judge said, "You do have injuries. What would?" amount to a, a, a section 18 charge and he said um, no one's explaining or telling us or putting up where these come from he said so i'm gonna um i had eight year set in my mind and he said but i'm gonna cut that down to four year and so it went from four year to eight year nine month within an hour literally an hour a car van came and i was shipped straight to franklin Maximum Security Prison. So there's Franklin, Full Sutton, Long Larton, Whitemore and Wakefield. They're the dispersal top security prison system. So if you're in there, you tend to move only to their prisons. Very dangerous people, all the worst criminals are in there. Very high security. Some of the prison officers, funny enough, from home house had moved since the incident to Franklin Prison. And it was that kind of mentality of, um, you've done one of us, you've done us all. And no matter where I went, they followed me. Uh, I couldn't have settled down even if I wanted to because they would have made sure that I didn't. They started getting the gear on and coming with the gear and it just stemmed from there. Then I would fight them and uh, attack them. I ended up, um, they would come in uh, and it was just hatred on both sides, you know, a dislike on both sides by now. They wouldn't open my door unless there was uh, at least six, seven prison officers with ride shields, ride gear on. They used to have the shields and they wouldn't come, in, come to my door um, without them, really, and, and, and that was my life, you know, that was what my life was like in that segregation unit. I'm not here to put the system down, you know, I was, sometimes you have to control people. And then eventually, because of my misbehaving and fighting the system and fighting prison officers, I ended up getting put on what you call CSC, and it stands for Close Supervision Circuit. And just to give you an understanding of this, you're in a maximum security prison, designed for some of the most dangerous prisoners you'll ever come across. Terrorists, you name it. I'm then isolated from them in a segregation because I'm classed too dangerous to be among them in a maximum security prison. And then I'm isolated off in a in the segregation and they call us a uh, close supervision circuit. Normal prisoners, even in a maximum security prison, don't see the CSC. The process of that is, is um, there's no physical contact at all. So if I'm getting fed through a door, um, they, they'll, they'll put like a metal box and lock it on the bottom of the door. They'll unlock one side, put your food in, lock it, and then unlock the other side so you put your hand in to get it. That's how you've got anything. I'll give you a little in inkling of the situation. When a normal person goes, is in the segregation unit, and he goes off into the exercise yard, which is practically a cage, in the second in there. So there's a big cage with a thing and then there's a cage inside that. And there's two beside each other so you can run around and talk. Normal people in the segregation, the maximum security prison, will just go out with the officer, they'll open the gate and they'll walk in. I had to go through a process, so I had to stand at the back wall, put my hands on my head, they'd slam the door open, they'd put the shale into the doorway, I'd have to walk back, backwards, with my hands on my head, slow as I possibly can, no like as soon as my back touched the shield, they would then step back and I would have to walk slowly again until my hand touched the shield. They'd tell me to step to the side, my, my back, they'd tell me to step to the side and then they'd slam me up against the wall with the shield. I'd have to put my hands out and then when I did that, one officer would grab that arm, another one with that arm, with all the right gear on, 
and then they would search each side and then I, they would like back off me and then there'd be a riot shield there'd be like six seven eight prison officers all in riot gear behind the shield and they would slowly walk back and walk back and i would have to walk backwards my hands on my head if i made a sudden movement hold on they'd be on me but then i got to a point where they'd handcuff me i'd have the shields on me man the shield front back I'd, they'd have hold of me either side because i'd still try and knock them and spit at them so there's practically handcuffed from behind hands under me each side I'd have my head back and would slowly walk take me about half an hour to get just around the corner then once I got in the cage I'd have to get down on my knees with my hands on my back my face like on the floor they'd open the door you'd hear the panic in them they'd all be ready in a line to the last one who would be on me keeping me and he'd be have the handcuffs on and and practically it's a, a minute the handcuffs go off to go 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 and all of them would leg it out and by the time they got to the gate i was up and trying to get to the gate before the gate closed so i could try and get them and i just kept getting shipped out and then what happened is it gave me a chance so i'd go to the jail and i started getting a bit clever really so i started studying the laws of the arts of all books and all that out of the library i've been behaving with that so I was getting a bit clued up on what they can and can't do. And so when they were putting me in a prison and leaving me there for months and months and months on end, I'd then start making like legal complaints so like this shouldn't be happening. And what happened is that they'd, they'd, they'd let me on the wing. And within a month, I'd be dragged back down the side again. Drugs, fight, prison officers feel threatened, whatever. Um, the tension when I was on the wing was that bad between us. One day, they come to the door with the gear on. As soon as they come in, charge at them, bang, fighting. Uh, it lasted for ages. It lasted for about 15, 20 minutes. And when you're getting muffed up with right gear and it's lasting that long, it's, it's believe me, it's, it's, it means you're kind of good, really, in a sense. To the, off and the inmates, I got respect through the system because of that. But I remember this one time, they got me in and I went to the back of the window and I stood there for a little bit extra and I thought, this is not right. And as I went to turn, they just smashed the, the like really hard, smashed the shield. So I went up against the wall. I had a prison officer who had all the reach hand. But what they didn't count on is instead of me letting go so they could get me, I slid my hands down the wall. So I sort of went up and it was all instant, quick as you can think. Hands went on the wall, I slid my hands down, turned and I sort of got one and sort of picked them up with my legs and fell with them. When I fell, I was on the floor, so I'm on top of them a bit and he's sort of down. And I pushed with my legs, kept pushing, kept pushing. And I got him into the like um, into the corner in between the toilet. And he had the riot helmet on, the right shield. Yeah. So I'm on top of him now. And I've got, I'm looking directly into his eyes. And prison officers now are into a bit of a panic now. You know the panicking. So booting me, kicking me, pulling my head back, trying to like, trying to stop your breathing, everything. They were doing it out of panic. And then... Um, I started getting my hands up, I wasn't bothered about them. All that was blocked out for me. I just remember looking at him, it's all fear. And I just looked at him, I, I got my hands so far up his shield, I had my hands about that far up, about here. And all I remember saying to him was, dude, if I get your neck today, you're not going home, you're dead. And he panicked. I heard the panic in him. I know when you hear panic, <laughs> I heard the panic. We said, get him, get him off us, get him off us. And after a while they got me, handcuffed me, battered me all over. One of them got me neck. Like, you know when they're feeling when you drown them? So one of them got my neck, so I'm handcuffed. One of them got my neck. Like, choked me, choked me. And just as I felt, I was like, into that panic of going like that. He'd let go. And just as I tried to get my breath, he'd do it again. And they were doing that for ages to me. And then uh, just punching me, booting me. And then they said to me, which made me laugh actually inside. I remember one of them saying, you coward. I remember thinking, six or seven prison officers were right shield, right gear. They've got a handcuffed man who's defenseless on the floor. They're beating the living daylights out and while he's defenseless on the floor and they call me a coward. You know, I, it, it just, I just couldn't understand what that they actually, you know, who's the coward, you know. And But then it top, what topped it off then is that the, 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 I don't know if it's SRPO, what's the main officer. She came in and she was like, is everything all right? Knows what's just happened. So I just held my breath, I was like, yeah, of course, why shouldn't there be? 
But uh, one day they come and they just have to get me moved about. One of them, they said, oh, we're going to put you on a ferry, you're going to go to the Isle of Wight. So I got into the Isle of Wight and um, for the first time, and I can't say names really, but got involved with a few people who were involved in selling heroin in prison. Uh, Realised how much money you could make and we started selling heroin. Um, uh, and what happened was I was getting me free canteens, getting the gyms, I was taking a few steroids at the time. And um, we were just doing business like that. And what happened is there was this lad, this Christian, started trying to tell me about God. I just thought, you're a nutcase, you know what I mean? You know, get away, you know. He said, um, I've been in prison for years and years and years and I'm never getting out again. But I'm free. He pointed at his chest. And it, it pruned up my ears. Not because I understood what he was saying. It was because I didn't understand what he was saying. How can a man be in prison for the rest of his life? Never ever going to be getting released ever again because he's in for murder. And be free. I couldn't get it. I couldn't grasp it. So it was puzzling my brain. But I carried on doing what I was doing. Oh, ten prison officers came. They said I was going to segregation unit for subversive behaviour. Which I didn't have a problem with what that meant at the time. And um, smuggling drugs into the prison. I decided to kick off. I went on a dirty protest. I smashed the glass out of my door. Put rug poo all over myself. Rug poo all over the, all over the um, cell. And just wanted to make my life a bit hell. Because no, it's not nice walking in at work in the morning and barking. Because you know, that's the whole purpose of doing it. Make their life hell. Prison officers come. Said, look, you know, we, you've had your chance. You're going back to the top security prisons. And that's when I went to Long Lart and Maximum Security Prison. And I was in there for a couple of weeks, ruthless prison. And they came to me and said, education. And when I got education, like, you've got to understand this, in prison they've got what you call movements. And so on the wings, when you do movements, they'll come and open your cell doors and you'll go to your destination. When you get to the other end, there's two prison officers stood there. And if your name is not on the list, they should have sent you back. I made a fuss, I was like, what, you, I've come all the way down here and made a fuss, and one of them, I must have done his edit, because he went, go to the chaplaincy down there. And so I went to the chaplaincy, and when I went to the chaplaincy, I walked in the middle, I saw this circle of lads, saw this TV with the posh man, you know, hello, and all that stuff on the, on the telly. God has revealed himself in a person. We've looked at that. He's revealed himself in Jesus. That's the ultimate revelation of God. When I finished, I was going to go and the little lass went to me, um, are you meant to be here? I gave her my name. She said, oh, your name's not on the list. So I went to go. When I went to go, one of the lads went, you get free chocolate gatos and biscuits. And I thought, oh yeah, miss, can you keep my name down? And that was the only intention I went on this course, was the biscuits, get out yourself, coffee, whatever. And that's why I was going. And that's the beginning of me hearing the real Bible, I guess, that what really gets preached and stuff, and it was opening me up. Um, and this was the, what, what happened then is, I ended up going in, I keep going, argue, thought they're all nuts. The chaplain here was there doing the alpha, he came over and he said, look, I've never done this in all the years I've worked here, but God is telling me to tell you to come here this afternoon. So I thought, okay then. So I went and the only, I was only planning on going to, um, to basically uh, get out my cell, get the biscuits, get the coffees. And I uh, went and we put the chairs together. When we put the chairs together, we said, right, I'm going to say some verses out of the Bible. One of them was, um, no one's righteous, not one, we all fall short of the glory of God. And the other one was um, about Jesus dying on the cross. And then he explained, um, uh, he explained to me, and he said, um, He said to me, um, pray. I remember saying, what do I pray? He said, just from your heart, pray. And I just said, look, but God, if you're real, come into my life, because I hate who I am. I hate who I've become. And um, and um, I started praying, I said, I remember saying, God, if you're real, please come. I hate who I am. I hate who I've become. Come into my life. And then um, I prayed all that. I remember saying other stuff. And as I, I stopped talking, stopped praying. And um, when I stopped praying, 
um, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And I was like, um, okay, what's going on here? And this feeling started raising up, raising up, raising up. When it got to about my chest, it just I just burst out uncontrollably and I cried my eyes out. And I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed uh, uncontrollably. And from that moment on, I knew God was real. I just knew. Just changed my life, you know. Um, I, I try not to get upset, but it doesn't get any easier for some reason. Because the longer I'm, I'm changed, I'm a, I'm a different person. The more it hits me, because the more I realise um, what I've done. Um, and that's the biggest thing when I became a Christian, is suddenly realising all your life that you've been wrong. And that the people who you've hurt, the people who you've damaged. Um, it's hard to face sometimes, I know I'm forgiven, and I believe that. But still, it's good to have a bit of remorse um, for what you've done. One day, he just phoned me and said, Mum, I found Jesus, and I put the phone down on him. I laughed at him, I thought he was taking the mick out of me. And I actually, I thought he was using the excuse to be released from prison early. Me, idiot, not realised he was due to get released in a few months anyway. My name's Nicky Gamble. I was an atheist. When I was in university, I read the New Testament. And uh, as I was reading the New Testament, the person, it was like the person of Jesus emerged from the pages of the New Testament. And I encountered him. And that totally changed the direction of my life. I practiced as a barrister uh, for a number of years, and I'm the vicar of HTB, and People describe me as the pioneer of Alpha. Alpha is opportunity to explore the meaning of life. And it's designed for people who don't go to church, who wouldn't call themselves Christians. And it's a very low-key, non-threatening, fun way to explore the most important questions. Like, why are we here? Is there a purpose to my life? Does it have meaning? What happens when I die? So we have now over 100 countries in the world are running Alpha. We have offices in 58 countries. And it's it spread. 25 million people have done the course. And it's growing all the time. Alpha started in the prisons in 1994. Someone who was in prison had a girlfriend who was doing the Alpha course here. And that's how he heard about it. And, he, and he, this guy said, well, I'd love to hear more about it. Spoke to the chaplain, and the chaplain invited me to go down. And I couldn't go, but I sent a team down. And a team went into the prison, and remarkable things happened. Uh, a father and son who had been involved in the, the largest import of cannabis ever into this country at that time. Uh, encountered Jesus. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Their lives were radically changed. Alpha spread from prison to prison and then to you know, over half the prisons in, in the UK and in 80 countries around the world. Last year, 50,000 people did Alpha in prison. When I heard that she had become a Christian, um, no, it wasn't cynical about it because I'm a Christian. And I guess, oh, and I believe God can change anybody's life, anybody's life, you know, even Shane Taylor's. I kept a distance. I didn't um, get in contact with him for two or three years after knowing through the grapevines that were that he'd become a Christian. He was doing certain things around the area, which I never went to. Um, but then it got to the point where I felt, no, it's right to, to actually go and see him, to ask the governor at the time's permission if I could actually go and see him, which I did. And it was surreal to see the difference, if I'm being completely honest with you. Absolutely surreal. Uh, this aggression had gone, the anger had gone. And this big softies in front of me, to be honest with you. Um, it's lovely to see him with his family, his wife. And it was just nice to see a totally different Shane Taylor, this guy that you, you knew from old, that you've never turned your back on. And suddenly it's like this guy's like a role model for people to follow. Home House, I, I can't do nothing but give credit to. At the end of the day, I did a lot of stuff in Home House prison, but yet they've got such a heart for rehabilitation that they just, it's unbelievable that they've looked beyond what I've done to allow me to come back in because they're just. They're just desperate to see the lads uh, keep out of trouble. See, when I was in prison, I never saw it. I just saw the, the, the white shirt, the enemy, the prison authority, the keys. I never saw, I never thought that beyond that, the, there's actually officers who go out the way to try and help um, 
inmates not come back? He has come by, I had the same shame, I never heard of him, we both went our separate ways. And uh, obviously I felt with him with the wrong crowd, I'd done my own thing and before you know it I was I was I landed myself in prison. A decent prison sentence and uh, I remember I'd been in there for a while and uh, my auntie sent me a booking and I was I read it and I was like, wow, that's a bit mad. And I rang my auntie and I told her about this, but me reading this book, I said, I know this guy. She went, oh, you know him, dear? She went, yeah, she went, that's funny, because he wants to come and visit you. As soon as he walked in the doors, I could just see his, his eyes. He had like this love and care face. It changed from a, like a psychotic murderer's face to like a, like a kind, loving face, you know, like a humble face, a little like a humble person. I don't believe that only, a, only God can change a man like that. You know, it, his story is unbelievable and it, and, it, and it affected my life. It'll affect my life the rest of my life. His story and the way he is now, it's, it's, it made me become open-minded about, about God. An encounter with Jesus changed my life. And uh, actually, deep down, I'm as broken as Shane. I'm as broken as anybody. We all, we all have stuff in our life that is not good and stuff that needs healing. And Jesus is the great healer. He's the great savior and i would say to anybody who's who's watching this the good news is that you're loved that's what it's all about god loves you more than you love your own children your husband your wife your parents your friends think of the greatest love that you have god loves you even more than that and that's the good news God loves you so much, he came in the person of his son to die for you. Greater love has no one than this, and you, you die for them. But then you can experience that love through the Holy Spirit. That's what the Apple Weekend's about. That's what I experienced was God's love being poured into my heart. That's what shame experienced. That's what chains shame. It's love. It's the power of God's love to transform a person. And that's what you can experience. All you have to say is, Lord, help. I'm so sorry for the bad stuff. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me. Please come in, into my life by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all you need to say. And the moment you say that, he will come in. He makes that promise. He says, anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, if you open the door of your heart to him, he will come in and he'll change you as he changed me and as he changed Shane Taylor's life.